Welcome everybody to the fifth CIS roundtable devoted this time to the subject of science, or should we really say the subject of the story behind the science, how a person becomes interested in science in the first place, um, how important that vocation of science is for the world, and many, many other interesting topics. And I'm delighted to have you with us here so that we can explore these topics together. Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm a year 12 student. Uh, I'm currently studying physics and chemistry at the higher level for my sciences. I'm a super passionate science student and I'm really glad to be here today. Hi, I'm Tanya, a year 11 student, and I'm just really excited to be here. My name is Molly Goldstein. I'm a teacher here at CIS. Uh, this is my third year at CIS as a secondary teacher, um, but I have been doing this for about 35 years now and I have never been bored teaching the science that I teach. Hey, my name is Adrian. I graduated from CIS in 2018. I spent my first year in the Hangzhou program in year 10, and I'm currently in my senior year at UC Davis studying aerospace engineering. Can you think of the very first experiment that you conducted or saw that really sparked that interest that you have in science? I grew up in a family where science was highly prized. Both of my parents are chemists. And, uh, but even when we were little kids, he would get us outdoors and we would get a chance to see things in nature. And so we had a solar eclipse one year. I must have been four years old. And he built one of those little pinhole cameras that you could see the solar eclipse you know, projected through onto the pavement below. And for the first time, I was really aware of something beyond just my little neighborhood and something beyond bigger than that. And that sparked it, you know, that interest. And from then on, you know, I, my, I would go outside at night and look at the stars at night, and I would look at, you know, starting to learn constellations and beginning to know the names of them and, and see the patterns and the cycles in that. Um, when I was a child up to, like, I'd say probably year 10, I was really into um, evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. I think how I really got into that was when I was, um, like, really small, like three or four, uh, my parents took me to a beach. And then so within that beach, there, there were, like, so many things. There were, there were certain crabs, there were certain... Uh, like um, algae that was on, on the sand and I just felt really curious as to what all of them like what linked them all together the fact that on this earth there's so many different species there's so many different like families of organisms what really connects all of them together that really drove like drove my curiosity for to really discover how all these like mechanisms of life were built up so when we were in year three I think I was about seven we came to secondary and this was like to me just a mysterious monolith that I had never been to before and we went into a science lab. I don't think the new tower was here yet and um, there were just all these amazing contraptions like the ones you see in the room right now and all these diagrams and models and I was just awed and then what we did was we had this little pipette and we put water on a piece of paper and we just saw how long it took until the water kind of collapsed and they told us this was um, surface tension. And I just still remember that to this day because that was just awesome. And though I didn't really understand the science concretely, I still felt that it really resonated with me, this idea, it was like a process. This interest in science uh -huh. that you've all expressed, is it something that you feel is deeply within you, that you were born with, or is it something that you think is just the product of chance? I fully believe that as humans, just entities unto ourselves, we are vastly curious. And science is part of satisfying your curiosity. So just like you're curious about a movie or a book that you read, you're so curious about the world that we come in contact with. And I think it's the experiences that we have, and it's just these opportunities that come across our lives that, that um, you know, can call us in to explore more. Some people are definitely born with a love of science. Others are drawn into the rabbit hole through exposure to STEM education. But I think regardless, the best way to spark and maintain interest in STEM is through visual and interactive, you know, education. So whether that be experiments, labs, demos, I think seeing those tangible phenomena that you hear about in class as, you know, far removed and abstract laws and principles really helps you understand what they're trying to teach you and keeps you interested and keeps you focused. That was definitely the case for me, at least. There's definitely, for me, a sense of innate curiosity, but hmm. I really think it's spread across all, all humans. We, we have this sense of curiosity, as Ms. Goldstein <laughs> said, said um, and we really see it in our history, I mean, our migration patterns, the fact that we were willing to take this risk to, to you know, move all over the world, to invent all of these things, that really shows that we have the sense that, that we, we want to do things, we want to explore, we want to make things happen, 
And I think it's this drive that we innately have, but due to certain environmental factors, sometimes it's suppressed. Sometimes it's not necessarily shown. And I think this is the, where the role of education comes in, in terms of really helping that flourish to really get the sense of exploration and curiosity. Um, I think it's definitely chance and also a bit of nurture. Um, I think CIS does a really good job in cultivating this. For me at least, I was looking for something to read after the Hunger Games and I stumbled on When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Clanathy, which is one. just an incredible memoir about neurosurgery and mortality. And at CIS there came the opportunity to do career observation which is provided by Project Week and the incredible university counselors. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and I realized this is actually what I want to do. So there is a lot of cultivating and nurturing that goes on. I think if that had turned out to be another dystopian novel, my life would have gone in a different direction. Do you each have uh, favorite scientific breakthroughs? Uh, Fritz Haber uh, was a German scientist who worked on uh, figuring out a way to create fertilizer basically using nitrogen from the air uh, because they used to get the nitrogen from the nitrates in places like the guano of Chile and it was very hard to transport that. This was very early in the, like I think it was the 1920s. So he, he and a partner worked on this and they did figure out a way and because of what they did they have enabled us to use fertilizer to increase the harvest of our crops throughout the world. So now a planet that really is supposed to only be able to feed about 4 billion people is now supporting 8 billion people because of the impact of this you know, one experiment that was being done. And it's just truly phenomenal. I would say for me, it's the quantum revolution at the start of the 20th century. It's a very interesting period of time for me because during that period of history, before then, you had physicists who thought that they'd figured it all out. You had classical mechanics, you had thermodynamics, you had electricity and magnetism. And we had all these equations, all these scientists were thinking that they all figured it out. But then a series of experiments essentially showed that there was something more. What we previously understood was not the full picture. That period of time was really when mm. scientists drop their ego. They realized that there was so much more out there that we shouldn't take what we have for granted, that we should keep on looking and we should keep our uh, momentum of discovery. For medicine, for instance, when we have anesthesiology, the discovery yeah. of anesthesia, yeah, um, I just think that's really cool. Like the first time it failed um, and the patient was in great pain while they removed yeah. his tooth, but the second time, you know, it worked and now yeah. we have this treatment that can allow us to do surgeries comfortably and we don't even think about it. But these people who did this work in the 19th century, I think, around, they're the ones who paved the way mm -hmm. for the life that we can live now. What, what do you consider to be the most fascinating, interesting fields of science today? As an aerospace engineer, I'm obligated to say space flight and space exploration. I think looking up at the night sky and wondering what's out there is just such a basic human instinct that space exploration is something everyone can get excited about, regardless of their backgrounds. One of my personal favorites is really um, sustainable energy mm. in terms of how we can use our knowledge of physics and engineering to create something better for the world. Mm. And in sp specifically, there's this um, concept of fusion energy mm. that scientists have been talking about for a long time now. But recently, I believe a few scientists have actually simulated what it, was, what it would be like to be in the sun. So they built a, a mini, almost like you can think of it as uh, a nuclear reactor where they've managed to make fusion happen. Uh, this is just like an initial step, but the, the spark is there. Right? All we need to do is to develop it more, to make it more accessible so that this big renewable, uh, this is very sustainable long-term fusion energy can be accessed by everyone. Stem cell research and everything in the world of genetics is, is the big field of, of, the, uh, of the next century. Um, and I th also think, you know, you look at um, uh, biophysics, um, and you look at the ability for us to connect maybe even to our own brains, uh, nerve cells and into our nerves itself to mechanically connect to them to repair people who are uh, paraplegic um, or in walk around again. I mean, this, this is cutting edge technology. This is what's happening today. But are there limits mm. to what we can know? There is absolutely no limit. It's infinite, I think, what we can discover about the world around us. Um, and it's just like, I think, pragmatically speaking, humans will probably go extinct before we discover just a fraction of the secrets that the universe holds, you know. 
Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's just always going to be more and more organisms who come to exist, and that's just how the universe works, and I think that's part of its magic. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like there's an ethical dimension that we have to bear in mind when we're engaging in science? There's no good science and there's no bad science. What differentiates things that make a positive or negative difference is really who uses it and how they use it. Um, I think we've seen many examples in history where science has been used for bad. Um, and I think that as scientists of the future, what we really need to do is to have certain stru governmental structures, social structures, to oversee what's going on in science right now. I play a devil's advocate a little bit here because um, if you take a look historically uh, in World War II uh, with the development of the hydrogen bomb and of course the atomic bomb, uh, Edward Teller was a theoretical scientist. He was pure science and he just did it for the joy of learning. And yet it was his government that uh, you know, pushed him into working on the atomic bomb to bring his knowledge to that that project. I think it's a two way street. It's it's that it, it's a hum, it's a human responsibility. So yes, scientists and yes, government and yes, everybody has a human responsibility to care for one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's much easier for science to do harm than it is to do good, not out of malice, but just out of recklessness and and uh, carelessness. So I think it's important to ask yourself if what you're doing is ethical and whether or not it can help people. I also think uh, an important part of STEM education is uh, appreciation for uh, society and culture, because I think ultimately that appreciation helps you better understand the problems that you're trying to solve so you can solve them better. What message would you want to share with students at CIS about science. Just say listen to the science, like there's a lot to learn and I think once you start approaching science you realize that there's so much we don't know and your textbook could never possibly contain everything you're, you're ever going to learn about the universe and the secrets that it holds and that's just very exciting so maybe you'll be the next person who discovers something incredible about the world that we live in. I think there are probably two aspects to science. One is the more visual aspect of science. The um, the, the colors, all the things that people can visually see, and that's what really inspires them. Yeah. And the second aspect is the more rigorous aspect, all, all like the math, all the research that goes behind this visual concept. And I think a lot of the times, people are too, in, are too like absorbed into this rigorous aspect that they forget the joy of science, the joy of discovery. Mm -hmm. So I think my message would be to really keep in mind what science is about. It's about the joy of discovery and how we can use these discoveries to put them to good use, to improve the lives of others, and to also intellectually feel more empowered, that we know more about the world that we live in. I think advice I'd give to a year nine student would be to try as much as you can, and don't be afraid to reach out to people who are further along in their careers, because they'll definitely be able to give you good advice that only comes with experience. Also, don't feel pressure to choose a single area of study at such a young age. That ties into trying a lot of stuff is to figure out what kind of things you like and what you don't like, because science is a broad field. It really is keeping ourselves surrounded by nature, by curiosity and the ability to touch and interact with nature. And I think the more we can bring that into the classroom and the more we can bring ourselves out into nature, uh, that's gonna be what's gonna keep us in contact and give us that joy that we want, which sparks the curiosity, which makes us wonder, which makes us want to ask the questions, which then leads to the experimentation and the rigor that goes with it. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for taking part in this conversation. This has been really, really, really interesting. You've shed light on the, dare I say, the beauty of the world. You've given us insight into what it's like to be a scientist and the scientific method. You've given us uh, some real um, food for thought about our place as citizens in the world too, and the importance of embracing science and everything that it allows us uh, to do for one another and for the planet. So we're deeply grateful. Thank you very, very much.